Right now, we are currently tracking a guy found in Scripture in the Old Testament. If you have your Bible, you can flip to it either electronically or uh, paper. It makes no difference. Um, Daniel chapter 4, we're going to be there today. I want us to think about this, okay, that's on the screen. Trusting God when you become the go-to person. Let me ask you a personal question just right now as we kick off. Are you the kind of person that someone else would come to for advice, for uh, perspective, for uh, a need they may have? Are you a go-to person? You know, oftentimes we don't necessarily think of ourselves that way. But I would imagine in this congregation this morning, at this time, there are a number of people in this room who probably don't even realize that you yourself have become a go-to person. It doesn't matter what age you are. You know, you can be a go-to person in school. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that dirty word, school. Don't worry, it's not going to happen for a month, okay? All right, you can be a go-to person at school. You can be a go-to person at work. You can be the go-to person in your family. You can be the go-to person for people around you who you call your friends. It's amazing. It doesn't matter what age you are or anything. What matters is the person you are becoming, the person that you are developing. And uh, let me let those of you in this room who are of the younger persuasion, I'm speaking your high school and below, okay? High school and below. All right. So let me let you in on a little secret. Those people in this room who are of my category, okay, my category is I'm out of high school, and I praise the Lord for that. Yeah, I made it. I'm out, okay? I want you to know, we don't have it nearly as together as we pretend we do, okay? I'll just be honest with you. We struggle. We, we have difficulties, Sometimes we like to project ourselves as knowing the answer, but way too often we ignore the answer. And this is what just really just grabs me about the life of Daniel. Because when we are introduced to Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1, he's 16 years of age. And those of you who've been with us over these weeks so far, you know this by heart. He's 16 years of age. He gets ripped out of his comfort zone of being at home, living in his own native country, being swept away as a prisoner of war, and lives the rest of his life that way. Okay? And yet... Daniel became the go-to person. He became the one individual out of all the hundreds of thousands of individuals that were uh, taken captive out of Israel, Judah, the southern kingdom. And he alone stands as one who took advantage of when life looked totally at disadvantage. Here was a single guy who determined, I'm going to make something of myself. I don't care what my friends do. It doesn't matter what my classmates, my friends in the community do, what other people at church choose. I'm going to choose to follow God with my life. Now that is unbelievable. A 16-year-old fellow who over the course of 70 plus years, as far as we know, lived a life of distinguished service in a foreign country. Now, that puts the bar pretty high for me. I look at that and I think, wow, how did he do it? What do you think it, it required of Daniel? I just want you to take a moment. If you have a pen or a pencil, get out your bulletin, get out a scrap piece of paper or something. And, and here's what I want you to do, okay? Again, this is going to require a little thinking. I know we're not supposed to do that on Sunday morning. We're here to listen, okay? I get that. But this morning, hey, it's hot outside. So I want to stir things up, okay? 
Now, some of you will probably never come back next Sunday because I'm going to have you do this. I know. It just throws you out of your comfort zone. But take that pen or a pencil, turn to somebody, and determine for yourselves, okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. 30 seconds. You got that? 30 seconds, okay? Some of you can take a 30-second nap, all right? You can do this. At home, on Facebook Live, I dare you to do this with us, okay? I want you to construct for yourself the elements you think Daniel had in his life that made him the go-to person. Ready, set, go. 30 seconds. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. It's pretty quiet, isn't it? Think hard. The go-to person, Daniel, requires some things inside. Okay, the timer says you're done. All right, so, did you come up with some? How many came up with two? Okay. How many came up with one? Yeah, okay. How many came up with five? How many came up with 15? <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you my top three, okay? Just, just see if we match, all right? And since I get to speak this morning, it's my show, okay? So my answers are right. <laughs> okay, actually, there are no wrong answers here. All right, and you may came, uh, come up, you may have come up with some really great stuff. But I, I sat and thought about this for myself. I thought, okay, what would it take for a guy to go from nothing to something? And so here they are in no particular order. The first one, okay, is competence. I believe Daniel needed competence. We all need competence. You know what competence is? It's learning. It's discovering something and then using it. Competence says, hey, I get it. Okay, I can do that. All right? Competence takes effort. Competence is a willingness to learn something and to be the best you can at it to work hard at it. And sometimes it takes a lifetime. I think Daniel's competence just grew and grew and grew. Over the six chapters, 70 plus years, it's amazing to me as I read the life of Daniel, how his competency, I mean, right at the outset, now think about this, in chapter one, Daniel was just like everybody else. It was a level playing field. All of the Israelites, all the Hebrew people that were brought to Babylon, all started at ground level. They were prisoners of war, okay? Then a whole group of them, young people, and a select group of young people, then were taken and had an advantage given to them by the king, the emperor, the dictator, okay? So then Daniel was in that select group. Then Daniel took a stand. And when he did... It separated him from the crowd. And then Daniel took advantage of all the training that was given to him. He didn't sit around going, well, you know, I'm a Hebrew, I can't do that. And he, he didn't cry and he didn't whine. and I didn't get advantages like you did. He didn't go around demanding his rights as an individual. No, he just simply applied himself. And let me tell you something, those of you who are of the younger persuasion here, you have an opportunity right now at your age to apply yourself in a way that you have no idea how it will pay off down the road. Number two, his character. I believe that Daniel exemplified a character that could only be made by the God of the universe whom Daniel served. The God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The creator, 
the one who knitted you together in your mother's womb. Our awesome God. And he followed God intently. You see, to develop character, you have to be willing to go through the fire. You have to be willing to go through the fire of experience. You have to be willing to nail it every single day. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. None of us are. But what it means is, I choose to live an excellent character. I choose to be someone of substance. I choose to mark my way according to God, not according to my culture, not according to what's going on around me, not according to what my friends choose. And Daniel chose to honor God with his life every day. Now, just like you and me, Daniel had good days and he had bad days. Let's be honest about it. Between the lines in the scriptures, Daniel lived a life that was hard, that was difficult. But he chose to do it to the best of his ability. He was honorable. He was forthright. He was trustworthy. He was dependable. And on and on and on we can describe the characteristics of Daniel. That, my friend, is what makes up our character. What would people say about me and about you? What would people say about us? How would they characterize us? And that's the challenge. And I think that's a worthy challenge. Even at age 66, which I am. I mean, come on. There are a lot of you out here who are, who are adults. You've lived life. But let me tell you something. I know you know this, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Even though we are adults, and some of us have experienced life longer than others, we still have much to learn about following God. And whenever I get to the place where I think I've learned it all, I will not be here. Literally, I will not be here. I mean, any moment I finally arrive, God, take me home. I'm good to no one. So Daniel spent his whole life developing his character. And here's number three I came up with. Number three, okay? His commitment. There are a lot of people who give lip service to God. A lot of people. A lot of people praise Jesus. A lot of people claim God. You know, it's easy to claim God in our culture because everybody says, oh yeah, God, yes. And what they mean is they've got their own God and they worship their God, but they'll allow you to have your God. And it's kind of like the day that Nebuchadnezzar lived in. They lived in a time where you could have whatever God you wanted. And if your God was better than others, they would give head knowledge to that. They would acknowledge that. We live in such a day. There are a lot of people who claim God. There are even people who claim to follow Jesus. But then they bag it. They give up. They quit. Have you ever felt like that? I have. I have felt like that many times in my life. But the difference is thinking it and asking God to help you overcome it versus doing it. And there are a lot of people who sit in church every week who think, this is all good, I feel good, and then they don't. Daniel stayed true to God through it all. So let's jump into chapter 4. Now, chapter 4 starts at verse 1, of course. And at verse 1, it's kind of a, a bridge, okay? Those of you who have your scriptures, you can see. I'm not going to flash it up this morning. Uh, verses 1, 2, and 3, you look at it for yourself. You'll see that Nebuchadnezzar has just come out of a most unbelievable event in his life. And that is the uh, furnace with the three guys, okay? Okay? The three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right? So here's a a question for you. This is totally off base, all right? It's just an add-on that just hit my mind. 
What do you think happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after chapter 3? We never hear from them again. I have a theory. After that experience in the furnace, they became Babylon's first responders. I thought it would work. Obviously it didn't. They became firemen. Can I say that? Okay, they became firemen. They, hey, they're the only guys in Babylon that a fire wouldn't do a thing to them. I mean, they could rush into a house. and Anyway, that's for another day. Okay. Sorry about that. Those of you at home, you can shut it down now if you want to. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego honored God. God proved himself. Nebuchadnezzar comes out of that. His own soldiers, some of them, were literally toasted in trying to throw those three guys in. Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, this was like really big. He had never seen a god do such a thing in his lifetime. I mean, this blew him away. So in chapter 1, verse 1, he's talking about how wonderful God is. Okay? Here's the catch. A lot of people think that Nebuchadnezzar came to God at that time. He did not. He acknowledged God. He said, whoa, hey, oh, that's pretty impressive. And then he went on living his own life, living and worshiping his own gods. He acknowledged that Daniel's God, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God were, was greater, obviously, but he still had his own gods, okay? And that's where we find Nebuchadnezzar in verse 4. Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. Now, this is some time later. You have to read between the lines, okay? We're not talking the next day. We're talking a period of time, and only God knows how long of a time it was, uh, from chapter 3 to chapter 4. And Nebuchadnezzar, one day, is hanging out at his house, and he is enjoying the fruits of his dictatorship. Okay, that's what verse 4 is all about, okay? I, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm living a life of ease, all right? I saw a dream, verse 5, that made me afraid. Here we go. Chapter 2, he had a series of dreams that just blew him out of the water. Chapter 4, sometime later, okay, maybe a few years down the road, all right? Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. He had another one of those nightmares, okay? So then he calls the magicians and the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers and he tells them the dream, okay? This time they get a benefit. Nebuchadnezzar actually tells them what he dreamt. He gives them the dream and he says, now tell me what it means. And nobody could. Nobody could until finally Scripture tells us, at last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belshazzar. Daniel never refers to himself with the Babylonian name. He is always Daniel. But Nebuchadnezzar had renamed him. He is now Belshazzar. And that's how Nebuchadnezzar refers to him. After the name of my God. See? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar still, even though he acknowledged the God of Daniel, he still had his own, okay? A lot of people today in 2018 are exactly the same way. A lot of people acknowledge the God, but they have their own. Maybe even some of us in this room, unbeknownst to anybody else. We acknowledge the God, but we live for our own God anyway. In whom is the spirit of the holy gods? And I told him the dream. Okay? O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me, tell me, tell me what this dream is all about. Daniel, if you read, is, is overwhelmed. He is... He's taken back. Because if you read through the next few verses, what God told Daniel to tell Nebuchadnezzar. See, 
God planted the dream inside of Nebuchadnezzar's head. And when Daniel was told by God what the dream meant, this was big time. This was big time. Because what Daniel was told by God is, because Nebuchadnezzar is so self-centered, so full of pride, so full of me, 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 I'm going to cut him down to size. And when God says something, he means it. And when God determines something has to happen in the life of an individual because of their life, because of their attitude, whatever, he's going to do it. And what Daniel had to tell Nebuchadnezzar was, for a time, you're going to continue your prosperity. He kicks it off by saying, now, king, I hope this is about your enemies. Well, in a twisted sort of way, it was. Because Daniel had to tell Nebuchadnezzar, after a bit, and, and, and um, Daniel had no idea just when this was going to happen. He figured it was going to be down the road. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be cut down. And, and, and the dream is all about for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar, God's going to cut you down to size. Okay? That's basically what he says. And near the end of ex- describing the dream, here's what Daniel says. Look at this. Verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity Nebuchadnezzar listens he says thank you and he rewards Daniel I mean this is phenomenal the guy has been in essence told you're going to turn into an animal (laughs) Well, thank you. I know I already am. I'm a baboon. But hey. But you have a chance, Nebuchadnezzar, to make a change. All this came about upon Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. So from verse 27 to verses 28 and 29, a whole year passes. Like most of us, when we've encountered something, you take 12 months later and it's a faint memory. It's not like it was the day that it occurred. We remember it. For some of them, we remember a lot of the details, but not all. 12 months has gone down the road Nebuchadnezzar has lived his life of ease. He continues to be the dictator. He continues to enjoy enormous wealth. Every word he spoke, the people of Babylon obeyed. Life went on as usual. And the king answered and said, Is this great Babylon? Isn't this it? I mean, look at this. Look at what I've done. And I marked out uh, meism, okay, in, in red letters, which I have built, my mighty power, my residence for the glory of my majesty. You know, a lot of people today even sneak into church and live this without ever letting anyone know that at the heart of their life is me, me. I, myself, and I. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I've accumulated. Look at where I'm at. Look at all the people who know my name. On and on and on we go. And Nebuchadnezzar was no different. And Daniel said to him, 12 months earlier, King, this is going to happen. And then we see verse 31. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven whose voice do you think it was God oh Nebuchadnezzar to you it is spoken 
the kingdom has departed from you. Immediately the word was fulfilled. And Nebuchadnezzar was driven from all mankind. And he began to eat grass like an ox. He went from being a baboon to being an ox. You say, oh, that, that is such a fairy tale. Really? God doesn't do fairy tales. God does reality. And he took Nebuchadnezzar and he put Nebuchadnezzar on his hands and knees. No, he did not grow hooves. He was on his hands and knees. Seven years he became a vegan. So how many of us are going to go out today and have a lunch of grass? Okay. He ate grass. He became like an animal. His hair grew. His nails grew. And he tromped around on hands and knees for seven years. Count it. Eighty-four months. You do the math, 365 times 7, okay? Don't tell me what it is, all right? I won't remember it. All that time, every single day, Nebuchadnezzar wandered about the fields just like the animals. Forgotten. Who's going to hang out with a guy who eats grass? Who's going to hang out with a guy who never shaves? Who's going to hang out with a guy who never uses deodorant or mouthwash? No. Mm. So I learned some lessons. Lesson number one. Going back to Daniel. Telling the king this is going to happen. The first lesson that I come away with, the first thing that I think about and I learn is that unwavering faith knows that God has the answer to the situation you face. Daniel walked into the king. He knew God would answer. It wasn't like the first time where he went home and said to his three buddies, hey, we've got to have a prayer meeting. We've got to pray. I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea how this is going to unfold. I have to go in and say this to the king. Let's pray. This time, Daniel didn't have to spend time doing that. Oh, I'm sure he prayed. But more than that, he listened. And sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to listen. Listen to the voice of God in our heart. Listen to the voice of God through his holy word and his holy spirit. Do you know that the spirit and the holy word never contradict Ever. I'm telling you, my friend, God has the answer. It took 12 months for Daniel to see the answer. 12 months he waited. Some of us can't wait 12 minutes. If God doesn't do it now, then something's wrong. See, God always has his time. God simply says to you and me, trust me, follow me. Lesson number two I learned. Unwavering faith is telling someone what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. We need to learn that in our lives. There are times when I need someone to look me in the eye and say, David, you need to hear this. Instead of saying, David, this will make you feel good. Well, maybe it will and maybe it won't. The point isn't what the other person receives. The point is, am I willing to speak the truth? And if you are that go-to type of person, then it would do well for you to make sure you're in step with God and his word when someone comes seeking advice. We have a lot of people today who are spewing forth advice. 
frankly, a lot of it is nothing more than our own personal opinion. God's word has the absolute counsel that withstands eternity. And my friend, in the Christian community, we ought to be known of people of the word, not people of the feelings, the people of the events, the people of woohoo. No, it's the people who are committed to God's word. Now, sometimes it may be woohoo, and that's okay. Number three. Unwavering faith trusts God when you've done what you're supposed to do. Daniel told the king the interpretation, and Daniel went back and did his job and never brought it up again. We, we, we 2018 cultural people, we love to bring things back up to people, don't we? We love to remind them. I'm one of those. You know, I, hey, you remember? I, uh, hey, uh, you know, we, we want people to be reminded. You know, have you forgotten? Uh, yeah, we even text them reminders. Daniel, let it ride. Twelve months. I, th- I just imagine from Daniel's point of view, 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar is like, whoa, okay, God, I trust you. Ah, this leads me to a fourth one that is a bonus for you today, okay? A bonus for you because it hits me right between the eyes, all right? So I figure if it hits me, I might as well hit you too, all right? So God will carry out his discipline on sinful behavior regardless of how long it takes to unfold. You and I need to remember that. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, now if you're not, you're off the hook. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ like I am, I'm telling you, you may think you're getting away with something no one else knows. It'll slip by. No, God never forgets. I know I'm a recipient. I have been disciplined a multitude of times in my life by my Heavenly Father. Who, by the way, the book of Hebrews reminds us, the writer there, If he's your heavenly father, he loves you so much, he's going to discipline you. And he does it for your own good. I love that. A good reminder to me in chapter 12. My friend, we need to make a choice. And in fact, every one of us this morning, as we walk out of this room, are going to make a choice. Every one of us. You say, no, I'm not. Oh, don't worry, you will. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you, along with me, are going to make a decision. The decision is, I will be faithfully committed to Jesus Christ today. Or not. If you're in this room and Jesus Christ is not your Savior, you're going to make a decision. Either you're going to receive Jesus Christ, acknowledge you're a sinner, that only his blood spilled for you can wash your life clean, and only his grace can give you forgiveness of your sin, and then you repent. That means you turn away from what you were to follow Jesus with your life, or not. Now you decide which category you're in. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you're going to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you today with my whole life. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to deal with the stuff that I haven't been dealing with. I'm going to get in 
step with you or not. If you are here and you have no hope of eternity in your life, you can either say yes to Jesus or not. What will your choice be? In a moment, Pastor Chris and the team are going to lead us in a song. And as we sing that song, you get to decide. As we always do, we welcome you and invite you to come down here. There will be some of us here who would love to just simply pray with you, talk with you, encourage you. If you are making a decision this morning to follow Jesus Christ, we invite you to come here. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes right now. Everybody in the room, close your eyes, please. I'm going to ask you to think about your own personal life, not the person next to you or around you. Think about you. If you are here this morning, and if you walk out of this room without Jesus Christ, you understand you will go to hell. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. My friend, only Jesus can save you. And if you are willing and courageous enough to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, right here, right now, I'm going to ask you to do something. With everybody's eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And as raising your hand, you're saying to me, Pastor Dave, I am going to give my life to Jesus Christ right here, right now. I'm not going to put it off anymore. I am going to give my life to Jesus right here, right now. Would you raise your hand up so I can see you? Thank you. Secondly, this is for all believers with your eyes closed. If you're willing to make a statement to God, not to anybody else, to God, Today, Father, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to do it. Raise your hand. Just keep your hand up. Thank you. Dear Father, you have seen every hand, whether raised or not. You know our life. We ask that you would push us a little bit. Maybe stir us that today is the day that Jesus is going to reign in me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, you're going to stand. When you stand, now I'm going to ask you to do a second thing. If you are serious about what you just raised your hand about, I ask you to join me right here. You say, whoa, hey, wait a minute. I raised my hand, but I didn't know you were... It's not about that. Come on. I raised my hand. Are you willing to join me right here? Are you willing to stand up and say, yes, today. I'm today. Would you stand with us as we sing? Pastor Chris.